All right. Well, if you would open up your Bibles to Exodus chapter 13. Exodus in chapter 13. The message today is titled, Delivered and Delighted. Delivered and Delighted. And I intend to cover everything from Exodus 13, verse 17, so the middle of chapter 13, all the way to chapter 15, verse 21, the middle of chapter 15. So basically two chapters worth of material, Exodus 13, 17 through 15, 21. Generally speaking, in broad strokes, what we have is three main parts in the message. Even though there's only two parts to the title, there's kind of three parts to the message because the material breaks down that way. Um, first in Genesis, I'm sorry, in Exodus uh, 13 verse, verse 17 through the end of that chapter is an explanation of the situation as it is, which will help us to understand how a new situation develops, one in which uh, it appears to the Egyptians that Israel does not have any direction or ability to escape completely. So some, the Israelites leave you know, Egypt and they, something's going on and eventually the, the Egyptians say, these guys don't know where they're going. Their hearts change and they say, let's go get them. What happens in the meantime? That's verses 17 through 21, or through uh, 22 of chapter 13. The end of chapter 13 kind of explains what happens there and sets the stage for what comes. Then second in chapter 14 is what I'm kind of referring to as delivered, is uh, Moses tells us about God's final and decisive judgment upon the Egyptians and Pharaoh. We're told of God's purpose and his activity in setting all of this up. He puts all the chess pieces exactly where he wants them on the board. And then we read about his motive for doing all of this. And we are also told of that what is, I can only describe as the harrowing way in which he delivered the people of Israel from the Egyptians. I mean, he could have done it in a lot of ways that would have not been so dramatic for the Israelites. But as we'll learn, the drama of it was sort of the point for the Israelites, um, that he wanted them to experience that. They needed that. Third, in chapter 15, we read then mostly verses 1 through 21 in that section about the Song of Moses rejoicing in God's deliverance and confidently boasting in, his, in God's superior power and ability. And Moses is full of thanksgiving to God and full of confidence to God. The significance of that is that it's not just Moses' song, but let's look just for a moment. Exodus 15, verse 1. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang the song. What's important is that they themselves can say these things and sing these things and believe them. And so that's a change that happens. And so what I want you to see through all of this is that uh, even though we read that, that God um, did not leave, lead Israel out of Egypt the direct way to the promised land because they didn't want them to run into war, it's not just that he didn't think they were trained fighters. There was something going on internally in their own hearts and minds that was not ready for battle. Something was lacking. And so he sends them another way, and then he brings the Egyptians in, and God has all kinds of purposes in store for this clash. But one of the things that happens that we usually miss is not just he'd intended to deliver the Israelites, but that he intended to gain the confidence, the greater confidence of the Israelites for what would come later. And so that's at play here, and it's one of the major things uh, that God is doing. In fact, I think it's the major thing. And um, so let's, uh, with that in mind then, that is the uh, reason I've summed up the message as delivered and delighted. And with that, I'd like to pray with you for God's help and then to read. Um, I think rather than read the whole, you know, two chapters worth of material, we'll just read these a section at a time and work through them that way. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you now to take these words and uh, to do in our hearts what they are meant to do. That not one of your purposes for us here today as we read and hear and uh, sit under your word would be missed. That every crumb would be received 
and remembered and treasured. Each one of us have, have a need to walk out of the door of this building and this gathering today different than when the way we came in. Our needs are different, but we could sum them up that way. We need you to change us and to work in our hearts, to make us more like Christ, to strengthen our resolve in the world, to give us great thoughts of God so that our thoughts of the world might be small, to wean us from temptation, to encourage us. Lord, whatever it may be, we pray that you would meet with us, equip us, transform us more and more into the image of Christ. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Well, Exodus 13, verses 17 through 22. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. But God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt, equipped for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones with you from here. And they moved on from Succoth and encamped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light, that they might travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night did not depart from before the people. Okay. <laughs> there are several important points made for us here which we need to understand. First of all, the people are being led by God. It won't appear that way to the outsider, right? It didn't appear that way. The Israelites were there and they knew they had this pillar of fire and, and, of, and of the pillar of cloud and um, they were just following it. That's all they were doing. They were just like literally following God step by step as a people. But the Egyptians see the way that they're going and they think these people don't have a clue. Like that sounds just so familiar, I just would say, in the Christian life, right? If people would look at you and say like, well, if, to get ahead, you need to do this, 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 and this. And you think, ah, I understand, but God just wants me to go over here. And they think, well, you're going to lose everything. That's not going to work. What are you thinking? This is just the reality. I don't want to too quickly step away from the text and talk about, you know, how we might apply these things, but it just seems obvious on the surface in this case. He leads them in the opposite direction they, they ought to go, it seems. you got to get, I mean, we're trying to quickly get out of Egypt and get to the promised land. Well, there's the road, big highway to Canaan, and they go the other way. And you think, why would you, why would you do that? That just doesn't make any sense. Well, the second thing is that get, we're told that he leads them in this way because of a deficiency in them. There's a deficiency in them. He says he leads them this way because he did not want them to have to face war yet. Which is odd because couldn't he just kill those people and just let them come in? Why? Why do they have to face war? Just because there are people in Canaan who need to be dispossessed, why can't God just take care of them the way he's getting ready to take care of the Egyptians in a moment? Can't God just fight that battle? I mean, it seems... Right? I mean, you've, you've, and again, we've had this in our own lives. Like, I've seen God deliver this way one time. Can't he just do that now? Why, does, why do, won't he do that now? Well, God has a reason. Evidently, God does not intend to keep working in the ways that he has been for these people all the time. Right? He's not going to just, every enemy they have, he's not going to just afflict them with plagues until they relent and say, okay, we'll leave you alone. That's not what God wants to do. This was a special and a unique thing. He intends for them to have to fight wars and to have to do battle themselves. Again, there's a lesson there. Like, it's not just, just God's just always going to do it. I know we're going to read here in a little bit where it says, you need just watch what God's going to do for you. And there are times like that in the Christian life. But oftentimes, go battle, go fight, go do the hard thing, right? If we, by the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the body, we will live, right? This is what we mean. 
God doesn't intend to keep working in these ways all the time. At the same time, He knows they're not, they are not yet ready for this. They don't have the heart for it just yet. There's a deficiency in them. It says, verse 17, For God said, lest the people change their minds when they see war and return to Egypt. They lack the confidence that God can cause them to win a war on the field of battle. I know God can bring plagues and stuff, but if He's not doing that, and I've got to go fight these other people, it's not going to work. We're going to lose. They're convinced of that. That's their belief. They're not yet ready for war. He says if they would, would face war, they would change their mind and go back to Egypt. Now, how bad does it have to be in your experience to say, you know what, I'm going to go back to slavery. I'm going to go back to the Egyptians. They hated us. They, they killed our children. They did all these wicked things. But I'm going to die for sure if I go to war. So let's go back to Egypt. Right? Just because you're afraid... Uh, you know, just because a slave isn't sure what he's going to, is, is too afraid to leave, doesn't mean he doesn't hate where he's at, right? I mean, there's nothing good about Egypt, but he's terrified. they're terrified to face war. Sure, we'll go out of Egypt if the Egyptians are insisting we go, and if God's promised us something great. But if in between the great thing God's promised us and leaving the Egyptians, we have to face hard things that I don't think we're ready for, well, let's just go back. And that's what God said, I know that's what's going to happen. It's amazing. They saw, they've seen all of these plagues. We just read in the chapter before, it's been a little while now, but they heard that God was going to do this, and they worshipped God for what the deliverance God was going to, deliver, going to bring them. And, but now he, God says, I know they're going to want to go back. To engage in battle now would cause the people to shrink from their confidence it would cause them to even turn back and seek security in Egypt. That's the problem. The third thing we learn is that God leads them on a very specific route toward the Red Sea. Verse 18, But God led the people around by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. Now, so there's two roads, at least. There's one road, the way of the land of the Philistines. This is how you get to that land. This is the way to that land. God leads them around in a different way. But he leads them by this other path, by the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. By the way of the wilderness toward the Red Sea. And the people of Israel went up out of the land of Egypt, equipped for battle. So that's the fourth thing we learn, is that God sent them out of Egypt equipped for war. The reason they feared war was not because they were unarmed. It wasn't that they were unarmed. I mean, you might be afraid to go to war if you think, well, we're just a bunch of farmers and we just have like pitchforks and shovels and we don't have weapons of war. But they went equipped, fully equipped for war. And I don't mean they all had their shields and helmets and spears and, all, and chariots. and all. I don't mean all of that. But it, what I mean is it looked like an army in a sense. They could muster an army and be well equipped and prepared to fight a war. They didn't have a war machines and engines and all that kind of stuff, but they had what was necessary. They were more than equipped. What a thing. They were girded for a hasty journey, but also for a fight. That's how they went out. They went out ready for a battle if need be. At least they were armed that way, but their hearts weren't in it. They weren't ready. Now, what else did they bring? It's kind of, it seems like an odd thing that this verse 19 is in here. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones with you from here. What is that doing there? Why is that there? Well, one thing, it's a fulfillment. Just, it's important to show that they fulfilled the oath that they made to Joseph. But it's also there, I think, to help us realize that in the people's minds is not just we're getting out of Egypt, but that God delivered us, and God delivered us as the fulfillment of what He promised to our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and even Joseph and our forefathers. God had made promises to them, and they had a great confidence that this day would come, and we are now seeing it happen. And so, in a sense, carrying with them the bones of Joseph, you think, what are those? 
oh, hundreds of years ago, Joseph, who God was with and God worked through in a mighty way, had a great confidence that this day would come. And now, it is, now it's come. And what does that do for you as you carry those things and you see that? It builds your confidence too. In a sense, it, it, it connects your journey with these, these ancient promises from God that you know that God is with us in all this. Yes, you see the pillar of fire. Yes, you see the, the, cloud of, the pillar of cloud. And you also have you know, this man Moses leading you. And they've got this, the rod of God with them and all these things and they have. And they've got the things that God has provided them. And, but yet there's the wilderness. There's no way to go. There's this, this, I mean, it's not like, you think none of them knew that there was this road that went straight to Canaan? Why aren't we going that way? God's got us out here doing all this. I don't know what's going on, but we also, I also know and remember that God had promised this. And it took a long, hundreds of years for it to come to pass. But the things that he said he would do, he did. And those bones, I think, represent that. That's their message to the people of Israel as they carry them. God fulfilled his prom- fulfills His promises. So there's that going on in this situation as well. It should be in their mind. It, it is a constant reminder. Fifth thing, I said God was leading them, but God was leading them day by day in a miraculous way. Never once did He lead them alone, leave them alone, but He was with them every moment like a parent with a young child. Right? If you've got to go somewhere, you know, if I had to cross a parking lot with a small child, you, grab, you might even carry the child, but at least you've got the child's hand and you're taking them with you, teaching them what to, what to observe and what to watch out for, all of that. You're so careful to be with them. Or perhaps a newly married couple, just together, everywhere. Just, you know, it's just, it's kind of crazy. You know, we had to laugh. You know, there's times, that, you know, now we jokingly, Angela and I will jokingly say, somebody says, oh, do you guys want to sit together? It's like, it's, if it's a big inconvenience for people, we're like, no, we, we spend a lot of time together. It's all right. We don't have to be together right now, Right? Even though, like, we want to be together. But newly married couple, like, they're just together, like, continually. It's almost disgusting, right? It's, just, it's that kind of thing. It's, it's wonderful, but you don't understand what I mean. And this is the way the Lord is. He's with them every step of the way. There's elsewhere in Scripture that God describes this almost as a honeymoon period. Like, a, they're newlyweds, and He was with them, leading them, providing them, sheltering them, teaching them, consoling them. But it was a miraculous thing. You know, we could ask, what is this pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud? Um, I hope you don't have in mind they're two separate things. I think it's just one thing. So, uh, you know, I remember teaching the kids, you know, about like a campfire. You know, at night, it's burning hot and it's bright and it seems real bright. And then those coals, you can see how red they are. But then the sunlight comes out and it looks like it's not burning anymore. Right? It's just the, the coals that were so bright at night are just white ash and if you don't if you're not aware that they're still hot you could really harm yourself and I think it's the same kind of thing like in the daytime it's this it's this cloudy pillar whatever that is this whirlwind of cloud and at night it's it's fire it's glowing hot it's that sort of thing I don't mean there could not have been any variance of how bright the fire burned or how windy the and cloudy, you know, the pillar of cloud was. I don't mean to say that, but just that I think it's the same thing that just appears one way at, at night and another way during the day. This is God's presence leading them along. And so this is how the people got to their location, just following this miraculous pillar of fire and cloud, traveling, it says, by day and by night. It doesn't mean they never stopped to take a rest, but the reason God led them in this pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire, it says, so that they would, verse 21, the end, that they might travel by day and by night. They were moving, right? Now, what else can we say in terms of setting the situation up? Don't forget we have a situation in which the people of Israel are glad to be delivered. They are armed for a conflict, but are so scared of their inability, so lacking in a real confidence in God's ability to establish them, that they fear going into battle, even with His help. They would rather go back to Egypt if it came to it. Like, they know God is with them. They see that pillar. But God says, even if I lead them in this pillar up to that army, and I don't wipe out the army, but expect them to do the fighting, They're going to flee. They're going to run. 
They'll go back. Can't have that. They need greater confidence in regard to God and His ability to bring them into the promised land. And at this early stage, God sympathizes with that. He has a master plan to deliver them and also to build great confidence in their hearts concerning Him. So that's, I think that sets the stage for what comes. Let's look at chapter 14 then in this way in which God delivers them. Uh, chapter 14, verse 1, Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of Paharaoth between Migdol and the sea, and in front of Baal Zephon, you shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the people of Israel, They are wandering in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. And they did so. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the mind of Pharaoh and his servants was changed toward the people. And they said, What is this we have done that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made his chariot, he made ready his chariot, and took his army with him, and took 600 chosen chariots and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he pursued the people of Israel while the people of Israel were going out defiantly. The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them and camped at the sea by Pihareoth in front of Baal Zephon. When Pharaoh drew near, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, now who is are they crying out to? They cried out to the Lord, saying to Moses, Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us in bringing us out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. The Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Now it's as though, so the, pe the people complained to the Lord and they said this to Moses. And then God says, Moses, why are you crying to me? But what we missed there was Moses crying to the Lord. We never read anything about that. You have to read between the lines and understand Moses took the plea then to the people and said, God, it sure does kind of look like we're going to die. The people are complaining. They want to go back. They can't go back now. What's going to happen? Why do you cry to me? Tell the people of Israel to go forward. Now, he doesn't mean march against the Egyptians. Remember, they had been going this way. They got to the place. They're on the road to the Red Sea. And then he said, stop there. They camp there. And the Egyptians hear about it. The Egyptians come out to get them. Now they overtake them. And God says, what are you doing? Stand firm. Go forward. Go forward where? We're at the end of the road. It's literally the road to the Red Sea. We're here. Go where? There's nowhere to go. Lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host his chariots, and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who was going before the host of Israel, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night, without one coming near the other all night. What a thing. 
So they had light all night, and the, the Egyptians had darkness. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after, you can't imagine, I mean, what are they, th you'd think, okay, God's delivering them. We can't, we can't pursue them. But the Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And in the morning, and in the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and of cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained, but the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in His servant Moses. And that's the conclusion. So they believed in the Lord, and they believed in His servant Moses. What a thing. I mean, this is incredible. God's purpose for this judgment was that He would be glorified and the Egyptians will know that He is Yahweh. That's one of His stated purposes. He would get glory over the, the Pharaoh and over the Egyptians and that the Egyptians will know that He is Yahweh. What is His activity in setting things up? How does He set it all up? Well, first of all, He responds to Pharaoh's thinking you know, Pharaoh thinking, oh, the people are, you know, they're going out there where they shouldn't be. So what does God do? He halts the people, tells the people of Israel to stop. And then what does he do? He hardens Pharaoh's heart and he changes the heart of the people of, of, the, of Egypt so that they also are willing to follow Pharaoh and to pursue the Egyptian or the Israelites. And so this is what the Egyptians do. God's motive for doing this is that the Israelites would gain confidence in God, that the Egyptians would glorify God, that the world as a whole would know Him. It's amazing. And you think about, again, the harrowing way in which He delivered the people of Israel. It's incredible. They're stopped. they got the sea behind them. There's only one way out of this place, this road they took to come in. And here come the Egyptians. Verse 9, The Egyptians pursued them, all Pharaoh's horses and chariots and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them and encamped at the sea. In that same place, they encamped. So they didn't just, it's not just that they saw them from afar and came charging in and just start, went to slay them. They came looking for them, knowing which way they'd gone. They found them. They drew near and got close, and they set up camp to go attack the next day. They encamped. And you can imagine, so the Israelites are thinking, what are they, I mean, they're going to, this is not good. They didn't send out someone to, to treat with us and invite us to come back. They're camping, and they're making ready for war. We see what they're doing over there. This is not good. And they begin to freak out. When Pharaoh drew near, verse 10, the people of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians... This must be the next day, you think, or something like that. The Egyptians were marching after them, and they feared greatly. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. And what's their objection? They're just not enough tombs? Is that what it was? 
there weren't enough graves. We run out of graves in Egypt, and so you, you brought us out here so they could kill us here, and we could just be buried in the sand? Was that what it was, Moses? How thoughtful of you. What a great leader. How compassionate. Thank you for bringing us out. Th didn't we tell you that we should have stayed there? Verse 12, is not this what we have said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. And Moses' response, fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you and you have only to be silent. There are times like this, right, in the Christian life as believers. Just don't fear. Like the, when the, there, there, come, there will come a time when this idea of just don't be afraid is not enough. They have to not be afraid and go fight. But now, just, just do this. Just don't be afraid. Just stand firm. Don't give in. Don't give way. Don't go to invite, ask the Egyptians to take you back. Keep moving forward, following God. And what you will see is the salvation of the Lord, which He will work for you today. It never looked more bleak to them in their whole lives than it did this day. But now Moses says, oh no, just watch. Watch what God's going to do. The Egyptians whom you see today, you see them coming. You're never going to see them again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent. Now had God parted the sea, and the, and the Israelites went through, and the Egyptians stopped and said, we can't go that way, and the waters went back down, what would happen? When the people of Israel went to go back up to Canaan, they'd have probably met the Egyptian army again. They'd have seen them again. But God said, you're not going to see them anymore. They're not going to keep pursuing you. Don't worry. And so what happens? In order to do, make that happen, God had to harden their heart again. And this is what he said. Verse 17, and I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. A normal person wouldn't go. Right? If your enemy is, has a God and that God keeps delivering them and afflicting you and you find, decide, you know what, now's my chance. And you go to get them and then the ocean parts, right? Or the sea parts and they just start going through these walls of water and everything else. And there's this fire and smoke and all this. You'd think... Okay, maybe, maybe we stop. Maybe we meet them somewhere else. Maybe they're God. Maybe they think their God is too strong here. He's a God of the sea. And we'll meet them in the wilderness, in the desert. That's not what happened. God hardened their hearts so that they went in after them. God says He's going to do it. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they shall go in after them. Verse 18, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gotten glory over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. There's Egyptians who didn't make the trip. When none return from battle, not even one, they'll know God is God. Is God. God is Yahweh. God is who he is. I am that I am, he said. Then the angel, verse 19, Then the angel of God who was going before the host of Israel moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them, coming between the host of Egypt and the host of Israel. And there was the cloud and the darkness, and it lit up the night without one coming near the other all night. So it kept the, it, it provided a, a, a way for the Israelites to not be overtaken by the Egyptians that evening. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. This is a really curious thing um, to me, and I look, about the, look at this text. I mean, there's a lot of curious things, but um, that, like, when we think of miracles, we often think of, like, God just doing something that could never be done, or it's just totally, you know, otherworldly. Now, I don't mean that this generally happens or that we have reports of these things happening in this area from time to time. I don't mean anything like that. But when Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, the Lord drove the sea back by a strong... He used the wind 
by a strong east wind. I don't know how strong the wind has to be to drive the waters back, but that's what he says happened. This strong east wind. And the waters were divided. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground. The waters, so it dry, it, the, the wind dried out the ground and it drove back the water, the water so that they had walls of water. I don't know how high. Depends on where they crossed, I suppose. And it depends on how far back the water got pushed, you know, to just pile up right there. Like, you know, you have a big wave. It's, it's a big, long wave of water. And it comes into the, to, to the coast and it doesn't have anywhere to go. And so it goes up. And then it crests, right? So I don't know, I mean, what did it look like? Were it big tall walls or was it just two foot tall or ten foot tall or sixty feet tall? Depends on what movie you watch, right? Right? So I don't know. Um, the old cartoon, you know, had the had the shark even in there, you know, or whatever. It's kinda kinda funny. But so whatever. But we don't know how tall the walls were. How far down did they have to go to have, be on that dry ground? Depends on where they crossed. Right? There's, everybody's got a theory about that and all this kind of thing. Okay, fair enough. But just don't miss the point that it happened. It was, it was miraculous. But it's sort of, it's, it's, it's curious that God, I mean, that God does this. These miracles oftentimes, God uses means in the world. He didn't just, it wasn't just suddenly Moses stre- you know, stretched out the, the staff and boom, there's this wall and it's dry and let's go. It was instead all night long and it took a while. We're still waiting it's not, it's not dry enough yet. We can't really cross. Waiting for, the, for it all to get dried out. You think, what are we waiting on? Let's go. Can we just go now? I mean, if God's going to do a miracle, could he do just like one notch better miracle and we could just start leaving now? I mean, it's kind of strange. But what, I mean, I give you thinking, what is he waiting on? Like, just let us go. But this is the way God did it. You know, what would the skeptic say? Strange weather we're having these days. You know, it's like, no, it's not strange weather. It's a miracle. You might not recognize it that way just because there's wind and you think, oh, it must just be weather. El Nino is weird this year, you know. But that's not it. This was miraculous. And just because God uses a means like strong wind doesn't mean it's not a miracle. And the people of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand, on their right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now, have you ever seen an ambush? You ever seen this? The idea is, you know, maybe there's this path that the enemy has to go on, and we're going to lie and wait in ambush. If you want to be very successful, you don't just wait until the first one gets within firing distance and shoot him. Because then the rest of them won't come in. So you wait. You let them get all the way into the trap. And you got to tell all your guys, wait, don't fire, hold your fire, hold your fire, wait, wait for my signal. I said, wait for my signal. John, I said, wait. For my, somebody take John's gun from him. He's going to mess the whole thing up, right? And then fire. And then we all fire. And they can't get out. And this is the way it is. The people of Egypt, the, the army, comes in after them. And God lets them come on through. And then as they're in there, verse 24, And in the morning watch the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down on the Egyptian forces and threw the Egyptian forces into a panic, clogging their chariot wheels so that they drove heavily. So the water began to seep into the ground. It wasn't so dry anymore. Their chariot wheels are clogging up. They can't go. They were pursuing them, trying to get through, and now they're, they're having trouble, and they're getting into a panic because what are we going to do? They're freaked out as any soldier would be. I mean, yes, you're hard-hearted enough to go get them because you hate them that much, but you still are kind of aware that this is really scary stuff that's happening right now. And they are in a panic. And in that panic state, what's, what's it say? And the Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Well, no, duh. He's been doing it for months now. What do you mean? But as their hard-heartedness caused them to make the decision to go, now it's not going so well, and they come to their senses and realize, we have to get out of here now. 
Now the question is, will all the Israelites get out of here safely before any of the, any of the Egyptians can get out of here? And the answer is yes. That's the way it worked out. All the Israelites made it out, and all the Egyptians, pursuing them after them, however far they get, are not able to get out of there on either side before those walls come crashing down and destroy them all. It's incredible. Then the Lord said to Moses, so it, it's amazing, it, these, these are parallel, or one verse follows the, the next one. The Egyptians said, let us flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and upon their horsemen. It's like as soon as they're like, run, God's fighting with them. Moses says, Shh, and it's over. Sorry, guys, no escape today. It's incredible. And they die. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And, and as the Egyptians fled into it, right, as they were trying to run out, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. So you can imagine some of them, I don't know if this, if this means, like, if, if I should have in mind that some of them are like running out and the waters are there and they kind of get out, but somehow they're thrown back into the sea. I don't know how else to read it. It may not mean exactly that, but it's, it's something like this. Even those that seem to be fleeing don't make it. They're fled, and they're thrown, flung shaken into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen of all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. Not one of them remained. Um, I always like when I, uh, when like archaeology, some archaeologists find something that really supports the biblical record. And, you know, look, scholars differ so much on where this sea crossing was. Um, some of them say the Sea of Reeds, and, you know, generally, we, like, it was just, like, a swampy area. And the only problem I have with that, like, the real problem I have with that is just I don't see how you get walls of water and all this kind of stuff. It just doesn't seem to be deep enough to do that. Um, but uh, when we say Red Sea, uh, to be honest, the Hebrew word here is the, is the, the Reed Sea. It, there's no, there is no Red Sea. It's the Reed Sea. Problem is... Uh, there's no evidence anywhere in history that anything other than what we call the Red Sea was called the Reed Sea. It had that name, and it had other names, but it had that name, and there, were nothing, there was nothing else that they called the Reed Sea. So even though you've got this area up there that has lots of reeds in it, the Reed Sea seems to be what we call the Red Sea, and as strange as that may sound, you could dive into that and look at it, but even those who say that they crossed the actual Red Sea differ as to where it was that the crossing was, right? So I don't know, I'm not saying definitively. But what's wonderfully encouraging is to find archaeologists now who've been in these areas and find chariots literally down at the bottom of the sea. That's like wonderfully encouraging. It's like these rusted over chariots that have had like, and then um, whatever kind of sea growth grows over metal a lot of times, like, you know, barnacles and things like that, but um, like, after that metal has long gone, you still have like these shapes of these things exactly in a chariot shape, stuff like this. It's really, it's interesting. Um, does it prove that, that was the place where they crossed? No, but it's awful likely. I don't know what else it's doing down there. You know, bunches of them all scattered around this path. So it's, it's an interesting thing. Well, wonderfully encouraging for the Israelites to see all this. We have in verse 30. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. I thought we were never going to see them again. Well, you, this would qualify, wouldn't it? And maybe even better than seeing them again as soldiers, or maybe even better than never seeing them, their bodies ever again, to see their dead bodies washing ashore. Now, it's not that that's a pleasant sight. It's that it's a confidence-building sight to see these all the men we were afraid of, look what God did. There they are, dead and lifeless. God has delivered us. Sobering, but encouraging. Verse 31, Israel saw the great... What did they see? 
the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord and in His servant Moses. Now you see the wisdom of God. He said, we can't take them, by the way, the Philistines, because they'll see war and they'll want to turn back. I've got to show them that they can trust me, they can have this confidence in me. They need fear not. And so he puts them in a situation that in some ways seemed worse. Like now we're stuck. The Egyptians are coming. There's nowhere for us to go. And it's not just the Philistines we're worried about and some people that might defend their homeland. It's the entire Egyptian army, trained, horses, chariots, riders, officers. They're all here. They're coming. And God says, just watch this. There's nowhere to go. Yeah, there is. We're going to walk across the ocean. Across the, well, under the ocean. Under the ocean? How will we, well, not under the ocean. Just watch. All right? And he does this. But the Egyptians are going to come in after us. They are coming after us. They're going to, this isn't going to deliver us at all. Just wait a second. And this is what the deliverance that, that God works for them. And they see it. They see the power, it says, that the Lord used against the Egyptians. And so the people of feared the Lord, and they believed in the Lord, and then his servant Moses. That was this radical change for them. And so then, you have chapter 15, verses 1 through 21, this song. And let's look at chapter 15, verse 1. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord. Before we read the contents of it, let's look at verses 19 through 21. For when the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them, but the people of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea. Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing, and Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. So what this produced among the Egyptians was Moses and the people of Israel singing this song. In Miriam, probably this sister, the one who watched for Moses by the, by the river, by the reeds, Miriam, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, that is to the, all the people, so her and the women, singing and dancing and playing the, trambor, the, the tambourine and singing this song. Now, they sing the same song. You might think, well, it doesn't seem to be the same song exactly. Well, look at chapter 15, verse 1. They sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will, here, actually, I want you to keep your eyes on verse 21 and the, the, the lyrics that, of Miriam's song. And I'm going to read from verse 1. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. It's the same song. Moses is just sparing us all the rest of the lyrics and reading them all again. It's the same song. Right? We, a lot of our hymns and songs we request, have, the first line is the, is the name of the song. And this is what they're singing. They're singing this song. So what happens is, I think you could imagine the scene however you will. I, I could imagine it something like this. Moses, the, the, uh, the appointed scribe of, of Israel at this time, it says, Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord. You can imagine Moses just, I will sing to the Lord. Sing, sing with me. And he begins to sing. Or, or they be, begins to write it down. What are we singing? Sing, sing this. And they begin, some guys start singing. And they teach others and they start singing. And then someone else says, I have another verse. How about this? See, Moses, see if Moses is agreeable to this. The Lord is my strength and my song. He's become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise Him. My Father's God, and I will exalt Him. That's perfect. That's a perfect verse. Let's sing that. Moses and the people singing this song. Surely he didn't, I mean, I don't imagine, maybe you have imagined this, maybe you want to hold on to this, I don't know. But it, it would seem odd to me that Moses just stood up and just 
blurted out the, all the lyrics just kind of right like that, and the people just sang them in unison. It seems an odd thing. How does a song like this get written? How does it become sung by everyone? It's added to a bit of time. As all the people, their hearts are full, Moses leads the people in creating and singing this song to the Lord. And it's such a joyous and a spontaneous and a wonderful event that Miriam herself, in a, in a sense, sort of a, a leader of the people, of the women, certainly at this time, initially, what does she do? She goes out, takes all these women with her, they all take out these tambourines, and they begin to dance and play the tambourine to the song. And so they've all sung the song, but now the women say, we have a special, we'd like to dance to it and to play the tambourine and to sing. We want to perform this in front of everyone. And they do it. It's such a, an odd scene, the whole thing. But it's wonderful. These same people who were, ter- who were earlier, just the chapter before, telling Moses, see, we should have, been, have remained in Egypt, served the Egyptians, because we're just going to die out here. God's not going to deliver us. Nothing's going to happen. Now they look and they say, and they write this song, and they're all singing and dancing. And they're joyous. And they fear God. And they believe, it says, verse, chapter, the end of chapter 14, they believed in the Lord. They believed in Him. And so they sing a new song. I will sing to the Lord, for He has triumphed gloriously. The horse and His rider He has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. How, how powerful does that sound? He has become my salvation to people who have... For the first time in their life, they feel, have experienced the salvation of God. He has become myself. It's like in a new convert says, I learned, and I can call him for the first time in my life, Jesus is my Savior. And they all are singing this. He's become my salvation. This is my God. Not the God of the Israelites. This is my God, and I will praise Him. My Father's God, the one who made all those promises hundreds of years ago, and you kept telling us about them, we thought, yeah, That'll be the day when we're finally out of Egypt. That'll never happen. Well, now what? My Father's God, He's my God, and I exalt Him. The Lord is a man of war. We were in this battle. We needed someone to deliver us. We've got swords and we've got arrows. We've got bows, but we are not trained in battle. We can't fight a war. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is His name. Pharaoh's chariots and His host He cast into the sea. And his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Think of that. There's a visual picture in their mind when they say that. When, you, when those guys, when that water came in, they sunk like stones. They weren't swimming above the sea and just ran out of energy. They sunk. God cast them down there like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The floods stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. And the enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. That's what they said. You blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, and the earth swallowed them. What a thing for God to hear from the people who had lived all their days under these Egyptian gods and had been hearing by word these old stories about this God of their fathers. And they come and they sing this song to Him, Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders. Verse 13, You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. They confess it. You let, it was in love that you were leading us. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The peoples have heard. They tremble. Now this is now looking forward. They're going to have days of war ahead of them in Canaan. 
And this is the people now thinking about what's going to happen confidently. The peoples have heard, they tremble. Pangs have seen the, seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm. They are still as a stone till all your people, O Lord, pass by, till the people pass by whom you have purchased. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. When the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them, but the people of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea. Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. It's glorious. One more text. Revelation chapter 15. If you ever want to know where the song of Moses is found, if you can just remember chapter 15, Exodus 15, Revelation 15, and you'll get it. Revelation 15, verses 3, let's we'll start in verse 1. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. Sounds similar, right? Where, where are they standing? Beside the sea. The sea of glass. Right? What does it say that happened in, in the Red Sea? In the morning, the sea returned to its normal course. It wasn't like it was before with all that wind that had come. Standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. Not tambourines, but harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses and the servant of God and the song of the Lamb. Sing, great and mighty are your deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. This is a song not only of rejoicing in God's prior triumph, but also celebrating and, and, and boasting in his future triumphs. It was that way in Exodus, as they begin to say, all these other armies and these nations are going to tremble. They won't do a thing to us as we walk by because they've heard. And it's that way again in Revelation. Verse 5, after this I looked. And the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened, and out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with seven plagues, clothed in pure, bright linen, with golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures, and he goes on, and all this further thing, these further things happen. It's, an, it's a celebration of what God ha has done, a declaration of it, a praising of God for what he's done, and also it's a statement of our confidence in what God will do for us in the future. With that in mind, then, what's the application here? And we'll close with this. Often, even after a mighty deliverance in which we can rightly praise God, think about the Egyptians or the Israelites having gotten out of Egypt. It was a mighty deliverance. They can praise God. But we find that we're not yet fully delivered or that some fresh trial comes upon us. Right? They haven't yet got to the land of promise, but the Egyptians are coming upon them suddenly. Though we felt we had learned the lessons during our last trial, and though the sounds of our praises to God are still ringing in our ear from the last deliverance, somehow we're in a situation where we still fear, and we falter, and we doubt. But God is not to be doubted at such times. And His intent is always to deliver His people, to save them complete. His intent to save them completely is not changed or weakened. Beloved, God is gracious to us. He's regularly proving to us that He can be 
trusted to deliver us and to bring us into abundant life and eternal life and an abiding knowledge of God and the peace that flows from having our lives centered on the rock of Jesus Christ. He proves that he's able to do that and he can be trusted to do that. But in that process, we are also confronted again and again with situations in which we need help. We need someone to deliver. We need a fresh saving. Often, he doesn't appear to be on the horizon. We look up, and they didn't see God. They looked up and saw the Egyptians marching against them. But as believers, we cannot always and continually struggle with whether or not God will deliver us. We have to move past some of that. And whether or not God will fight with us and fight for us, we must instead grow in our confidence in God. Think of the disciples in the boat during the storm, fearing for their lives, worried that Jesus, who was asleep, would not deliver them. His rebuke to them was firm. Where is your faith? He said. Where is your faith? And yet, it wasn't just a rebuke, but he also, what did he do? He also did deliver them from the danger. What else did they, what would read next? Who is this that he commands even the wind and the water and they obey him? Right? It's like, so the, here the, the Israelites were, and they were in a situation where they had no confidence in God. Moses says, don't fear. Watch what God does for you. It's all right. I understand. They weren't rebuked for their lack of faith at that moment. Elsewhere, the disciples, they have a lack of faith, and God rebukes them for it. Where is your faith? Both groups were delivered. Right? Notice that. Both... Whether they had faith or didn't have faith, because God meant to deliver them, both were in fact delivered. The, Egypt, the Israelites, who had no faith, learned to have faith. The disciples, who had a great deal of faith but weren't exercising it now, learned to exercise their faith. Beloved, our great God is deserving of your trust. We can't be those that shrink back. There's a kind of doubting God that is met by Him with action that proves His ability to you. There's also a kind of doubting God that is met by a firm but tender rebuke, but then also deliverance, like with the disciples. And there is also a kind of doubting God that is met by a judgment upon faithlessness, which shuts some out from future deliverance and keeps them from personally entering God's promised rest. We can't be continually doubting God. You just can't be. You have to be learning to trust Him. So on the one hand, we must not think that having doubts about, about God is a disqualifying feature of your life. Many people doubt God and are still delivered by Him, and He earns their confidence as a result. But on the other hand, there comes a time when God has delivered and delivered and delivered and delivered in which, and He expects you to have confidence, to have faith. He has built enough in you that it should be exercised. Where is it? Exercise it. And there's another kind of doubting God that is so bad that despite every reason to trust God and to move forward, you still disobey. You still look to the arm of the flesh. And there's judgment for that, ultimately. There are times when our weakness, God recognizes what we cannot do and He makes allowances for us and guides us in ways that perhaps seem senseless according to the world. Leads us to the, by the way of the Red Sea. But He does that because He's working to build us and not just to get us somewhere. God's goal was not just to get the Israelites to the Promised Land, but to get a certain kind of people to the Promised Land. And they weren't that kind of people yet. And so He put them through these certain trials led them in a different way. What a thing. God's goal for you isn't just heaven. He wants to get heaven in you and then bring you to heaven. Right? He wants to change you. C.S. Lewis used to say, because God, because God loves us, He labors to make us lovable. <laughs> right? Because He loves us, He labors to make us lovable. Well, beloved, there are some giants in the land that must not be feared. 
because we've learned to factor God into the mental equations that we do when we do our calculations of what we think the future will bring. Right? There's always these hypothetical questions people put to you. Say, well, you know, if you were in a situation where you had to, if you told the truth, right, this is always the, the famous one about you know, World War II, hiding Jews. If you were hiding Jews and some Nazis came in and said, you know, you've got to, do you have any of these Jews? Are you hiding them? And you, you have to lie to protect them. But God says, don't lie. So see, you, so much for your morality, Christian. And it's like, well, wait a minute. You're, you left God out of the whole equation. What if I were to say, and we read this, right, from biographies, they're under the table where they are. And the Nazis come in and they look under the table. And because you've got a rug down and they're under the floor under the table, they see nothing there and they think you're mocking them and they leave all in a huff. You told the truth and God delivered. It's this kind of thing. Like, what are we, do we factor God into these things, these situations? You can bet these Israelites, when they were saying, better we go, we die in Egypt than that we come out here and die, or we serve the Egyptians than we die out here. They weren't thinking, you know, God might just deliver us. They weren't thinking that at that moment. They should have been, but they weren't. Right? And I'm just saying, as believers, like, we, we have every reason to trust God. Like, you've got to get to the place where you're factoring God into all this. This is the thing God did for them. As a result of being saved through the Red Sea, it says, and they believed in the Lord. They hadn't done that before, but now they were believing Him. These mighty acts of deliverance that God does in your life, small ones and big ones, they're all meant to gain your confidence. He's not done. It's not like, well, I got through that. I shouldn't have to go through anything else anymore. Oh, no. There's plenty of work still to be done. And even if there's no more work God needs to do in you, do you think that maybe, let's say you're perfectly sanctified. There's nothing, you are perfect now. Having created a perfect vessel to use on the earth, how do you think God might use it? Do you think He might do hard things with it in the world to accomplish His task? Of course He would. Now He's got this excellent tool to use, and He's going to use it in the world. Right? You take a hammer when you fasten it, when it's forged and it's solid and it's tough steel, you hit hard things with it, not soft things. Right? This is what we mean. I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ was perfect, and He was the only one who could do the hardest things God needed done in the world. Our, our rest is not promised to us now. There's a sense in which we rest now, for sure. Rest from our, de our works. Rest from trying to earn God's favor. Rest from all of that. I hope rest from a desire for reputation. Rest from a desire for so many things. Trust in God. But the rest that God has promised is on the other side of things. It is through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom. But we shouldn't get there without any confidence in God along the way. Step by step, we should know that He's leading us, He's guiding us, He's helping us. He's there to deliver. This is the lesson the Israelites were supposed to learn. Well, that's all I have on these roughly two chapters. Anyone have any questions or comments on anything that we've gone over today?